So our story starts here at the mid main homeless shelter in Waterville. People and families in need of homes often move from a short-term emergency shelter such as this one into subsidised apartments. However, for those with no family support or anyone dealing with mental health challenges such as post-traumatic stress disorder, apartments can be distressingly noisy and impersonal with no sense of community. There are currently no acceptable housing solutions which support a sense of both privacy and community. Often people end up back on the streets, resulting in a destabilising cycle of being shuffled from one unsuitable housing option to another, without ever having the opportunity to work towards a place they can call home. So this is Pruitt Igo. It's the biggest housing failure ever. Um, so there are almost 3,000 apartments here. It was demolished 22 years after it was built. Um, it did have indoor plumbing, but that was about it. Vandalism went up, crime went up. It provided neither individual identity or any sense of community. There were ventilation issues, it was terrible. This is the other aspect, the other end of it that has happened. This is tent cities, about 100 of these have cropped up. Um, they're here because there's a lack of available shelters, there's a lack of political advocacy and inconsistent social services. They do give people an element of choice and freedom, but they don't have any sanitation or plumbing. So here's this cycle. My fourth year architecture students looked at housing models that work to break this destabilizing cycle of rotating between living on the streets, the homeless shelter and subsidized housing. They wanted to know if there were examples of supportive housing communities that helped people regain their independence. They realized that the spatial setup of the mid-main homeless shelter was very similar in concept to a traditional village with community services in the center and individual rooms or houses around the periphery. They also started to discover that there are communities of tiny houses throughout America that operate using this concept, allowing for both support and solitude. These are a grassroots solution to the issues of anonymity and lack of ownership in housing. Through researching successful communities, the students discovered the necessary ingredients for success. There needs to be a minimum of two acres of land which must be within walking distance of public services or have access to public transport. There's always a community building, there's a requirement for the resident to volunteer, and the community must be economically sustainable. These fill in the missing steps of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. As well as security and physical needs, a sense of belonging and self-esteem is fostered. So, based on this research and in consultation with staff and guests at the mid main Homeless Shelter, the students designed a tiny house community sited on the banks of the Kennebec River in Waterville. This location was chosen because there are already two informal communities of people living in tents here, and the site is within easy, easy walking distance of the homeless shelter and all city services. They developed a site plan based on clusters of tiny houses with a community centre at the entrance. The clusters are close enough to each other to enable people to recognise each other, but sited carefully to give them each views of the river and a private back deck. Each cluster has an activity in the centre, such as a horseshoe pit, community garden or gazebo and picnic tables. So here are my awesome students. Each student designed a tiny house for the community, so each house is an individual. They then considered how to cite them and relate them to one another. So here we see the class holding the trees in their final position before being glued into one of the cluster models. And if you're an architecture student, getting the trees looking just right is a really big deal. <laughs> So all the individual houses strive to embody a sense of expansion, an important quality when in a small space. The top two images show a single pod that can have individual rooms bolted on or removed. Bottom left shows a tiny house designed to be wheelchair accessible. And bottom right has an angled side wall to enlarge a two-storey living space. In the two images to the right, expansion is expressed through soaring roof planes, floating lofts and tower-like stair halls. The image top left has two huge doors that swing outwards across a deck to align with the garden plot, welcoming the outside in. The image bottom left shows another approach to exterior space with window shutters that can be raised to create a shaded outside seating area. So this is of the house with the big doors, showing people enjoying the garden and the views from inside. It's a very traditional vernacular gable form with a simple floor plan, reinvented at a new scale for a new use. These show one of the other houses in context with the homeless shelter visible behind it and the Kennebec River in front of it. It uses a very simple shed roof to focus attention on the river beyond. 
You enter at the back through a lowered entry space and turn to see through stairs and a floating balcony to the view outside. A sliding barn door serves both bathroom and closet to save space. So our co semester culminated in a display of research images and models of the tiny house community at the first Friday art walk in Portland this May. Here are the students setting up the model tables. Pallets donated by LLB made up the walls of the outdoor room. We lit it up and even hooked up a monitor to run a video of the designs for the tiny house community. The students created their own community as they planned and organized their semester of work. From their first research to the final decisions about what to present in Portland and how to pull off the logistics of that, including getting 16 pallets, two model tables, nine models, a TV monitor, light and wiring down from Portland to Augusta and set up in the space of three hours, they made all the decisions themselves. So at least a thousand people came by that evening and discussed these ideas with themselves and each other. The kids had the most fun arguing about which tiny house they were going to live in. Some guys living on the street wanted to know if the tiny house community existed and if they could live there. This project is about community and offering a sense of hope and empowerment to those who often aren't given the steps to climb out of a hole. We are designed to live in community. It keeps us healthy and makes us live longer. While half of this project is about these really cool little living spaces, the other half is about the relationships between people, location and buildings. Finally, we came full circle back to the mid-main homeless shelter on Colby Street to present the designs to Betty Palmer, the director of the shelter, and her staff and guests. Our initial estimates suggest that people could be supported in tiny house communities for three to six thousand dollars a year, rather than the eight to twelve thousand that the state currently spends per household on subsidised housing. It would be wonderful to see this vision become a reality. It is an idea whose time has come. Thank you.